welcome and hello and welcome to our uh, moving forward, our alumni uh, strengthening black communities. Uh, my name is Daniel Kekoloi. I'm a special advisor on student success and faculty member of the School of Social Work at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. I'm stepping in as a host for today's webinar as um, Dr. Michelle Johnson, Associate Dean as uh, students, is not uh, able to attend. So thank you so much for joining us and a special welcome to our guest panelists. Uh, you'll be hearing more from them shortly. If you would now like to acknowledge, uh, we would like now to acknowledge the land we're on. This meeting is virtual and because of that, we are not actually gathered in the same space. York's land acknowledgement may not represent the territory that you're currently on. And I would like to ask if that's the case, that you each take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're on and its current treaty holders. I myself am situated in the area known as the Toronto and so gratefully acknowledge that I live on the same territory as York University. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations. The area known as the Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe nation and on the, on the North Shona Confederacy and the Huron with it. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dish with one spoon, one, one pan belt continent and agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Welcome again to our guests and to everyone joining us on Zoom to this special event in the Moving Forward Witness Series. During this panel, we'll hear from our alumni from the Faculty of Arts and Professional Studies who are active in various initiatives addressing anti-Black racism and contributing positively to Black communities, families, and students. They're here today to share a little bit about their journeys, to tell us about their involvement in the anti-Black racism initiatives, and to provide the expertise and guidance on transitioning from university to the world of work. If at any one time you need help with this experience or have any questions for the panelists about the content that they're providing, feel free to cl click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and our team will be ready to help you. So now I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. And I'll start with uh, Greg Wellington. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Craig Wellington, and I am the Executive Director of Black Opportunity Fund, a proud graduate of, of York, York U. And um, the, my time spent at York was really important, both in shaping my career trajectory, but also in shaping um, the, it, my approach and involvement in social justice movements, which actually started um, during my time at York University. So I, I'm very happy to be here and uh, glad to be on the panel. Looking forward to this. Thank you, Greg. And now I'll call upon Kamika McLean. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kamika McLean. I'm the General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of the private equity company, KSS Hoko Inc. 
PSS has numerous companies under its umbrella spanning industries such as shareholder advisory, construction, hospitality, recruitment, food and beverage, among many others. I'm a board member of the Ontario College of Homeopaths, uh, the treasurer and director at large for the Black Female Lawyers Network, and a board member of the Young People's Theatre. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Kamika. I'll now call upon Kevin Yerd, last but not least. Thank you, Danielle, and it's an honor to be here today. My name is Kevin Yard. I'm the Member of Provincial Parliament for Brampton North. And if nobody knows where that is, it's in Peel Region. I'm sure a lot of the listeners know exactly where Brampton is. And uh, I'm also the first Black Member of Provincial Parliament for Brampton and the first and only uh, Black Member of Provincial Parliament for all of Peel Region. So we'll discuss that and uh, hopefully we can, we can change that uh, course and uh, have more people uh, getting involved into politics. I'm a York alumni, I'm a graduate. I, I went to school and graduated with honors BA in political science. So I guess I'm, I'm in the correct uh, path that I had, I had uh, ventured to get into. I also attended Ryerson and I, I have a journalism uh, background as well. And some of you may remember me, I was a journalist for 17 years on, on the Weather Network as a weather broadcaster. So the two sort of mesh together and we'll talk a little bit about how that has uh, influenced me getting into the political sphere. So. I'm interested in listening and uh, hearing the questions from, from the uh, students, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. So thank you all. So we'll begin, uh, I guess, uh, with the questions, but uh, I'll go in alphabetical order uh, since you're all in different places. Um, so I'll ask Greg first. Uh, this is a kind of a two-barreled question, but I'll maybe ask you the first part. And then we'll get into the second part of the question. So how did your time at York train you for the work that you're currently doing? Uh, great, Greg first. Sorry, unmuting. Uh, in, it didn't teach me how to unmute. Uh, uh, but in terms of the time I spent at, 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 at York, um, so my, my approach when I, when I came to York uh, was actually to enter into a law career. Uh, and then during my time at York, I actually got involved in broadcasting in uh, at that point in time, York, uh, while I was there, York got their FM license. I was a co-host of a talk radio show on the network that was used uh, as part of the profile. Uh, because it was about black community issues. I remember way back when we were we we interviewed Chief uh, Julian, then Chief Julian Fantino from around the, you know the Jane and Finch area about issues about um, you know black people in the area being uh, arrested and so on. We did a lot of work with the Jane and Finch Concerned Citizens Association and and so on, and we became involved in social justice issues when fellow York students were actually. Um, assaulted and arrested by police in Peel region, um, some of my, my classmates. And we had to be called into action because they were actually charged by, they were beaten by police and then charged by police with assault and were um, going to go to jail um, with some very serious charges. So we organized um, a rally at York um, and one of the professors, Professor Livy Vizano, who was a sociology professor there, on uh, conformity and deviance said, well, why don't you do it in my lecture hall? And we did it as part of the lecture hall. We recorded it as part of our radio show. We brought in Lennox Farrell. We brought in the head of Urban Alliance of Race Relations. We brought in the attorney general and we um, recorded, we, we brought in all of the media and based on, on the momentum around that, um, they, they got up, they, they, they got justice. And I and became a lot involved in, in, in that path, but I became very disenfranchised with the criminal justice system at that point in time. My goal was to be a criminal justice, in uh, being a prosecutor. And, and I, it be, I became very disenfranchised with that. And it kind of changed my trajectory. I used the background um, in journalism, my English degree, um, got involved in marketing. So that has always been a trajectory of my career. And I've always had a multiple trajectories. Um, you know, you're always told to pick a lane. I never picked a lane. So I have a very broad background in marketing, sponsorship, fundraising, 
um, um, executive education programs, um, a range of stuff that has always helped me on my on my career. Um, and I've always continued that social justice path that, you know, in the work that I've done with policing, with the education system, um, all the way along that has always been kind of a parallel path. And here I am at Black Opportunity Fund, which is focused on dismantling anti-Black racism and providing pools of capital available to Black entrepreneurs, not-for-profits and, and charities. So it's kind of like the perfect um, circle for me. And um, uh, a lot of that work is because of the networks and the activism that you're not only supported, but nurtured. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that's really very good. And uh, maybe I'll call on Kamika to sort of ask the same question. I think, Greg, you touched on the second part, but uh, so I'll ask Kamika, how did your time at York train you for the work that you're doing? Um, well, after Craig's very eloquent response, um, <laughs> I don't know if, if my response will be worthy, um, but when I thought about this question, I thought about it quite differently. Uh, when I moved to, when I started York, I was 18 years old, and I was a new immigrant to the country, and so I was on my own for the first time in my life uh, without parental supervision. My mom wasn't making my meals or doing my laundry or waking me up in the morning to get to classes. And so my time at York, I feel like I had to develop a level of independence um, and self-motivation in order to be successful. And I think that that's something as a lawyer that has worked in-house as well as in private practice you don't get to a certain level of success without having that drive within yourself and that push and that self-belief. And I think that my time at York has definitely solidified that for me and kind of brought that home. Thank you. And uh, maybe I'll ask a second part before we move on to Kevin. Um, when and why did you become involved in supporting and leading the initiatives in Black? communities. That was the second part, but Craig touched on it, but I would like to hear a little bit more from you. Exactly. Um, and, and, go ahead, Kamika. I was going to say, uh, supporting Black initiatives or initiatives within the Black community is always an easy thing to do because I'm not a self-negating person. Any initiative related to Blacks or females are a very comfortable space for me. I've personally accessed um, many of these kinds of um, projects and groups to gain a sense of understanding and community to help me navigate the legal profession, just uh, to find some level of camaraderie, um, a place where I feel like I can be myself and let down my hair proverbially. Um, so having personally benefited from programs like this, it's, it's really difficult once you come through the system to a certain point, not to look back and want to give a helping hand to help those behind you. That's, a, that's excellent, uh, Kamika, thank you so much. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add to, in terms of how you, you know, the time at York prepared you for what you're currently doing and when and why you've been involved in supporting and leading initiatives uh, in the black community? Exactly. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, obviously, uh, as a political science graduate, I've learned the inner workings of the provincial, the federal, the municipal government. So it has definitely prepared me for uh, a career in politics. So if anyone's interested in getting into politics, obviously, uh, taking a course in political science is, is something I, I would expect most people to do. Um, after I, I got into politics, once I got into politics, I'm became part of the first and only uh, Black Caucus in Ontario. And with the Black Caucus, uh, myself and uh, four other members, um, Laura May Lindo from Kitchener Centre, Faisal Hassan, who's uh, from York uh, Southwestern. Um, uh, let's see, who else is there? Rima Burns McGowan, she's in Toronto Beaches East York, and Jill Andrew from uh, uh, Toronto St. Paul. So the five of us, what we do as members of the Black Caucus, is we look at every 
aspect of politics, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, and we look at it through the black lens and how we can improve uh, uh, the life of, of uh, black citizens uh, in, in all of those aspects. So uh, this is something we've been doing over the last uh, three and a half years and uh, something which I'm really uh, passionate about and I'll continue to do. Uh, of course, in, in my writing of Brampton and Brampton North, there's, there's a, a large uh, uh, ethnic uh, diversity in, in our in our writing. We have uh, Punjabi speaking, we have Black speaking, uh, Caucasian uh, members as well. So so it's, it's more or less like a melting pot. And there have been some some issues rising in the um, Peel District School Board that we've we've had to uh, confront uh, with uh, parents uh, approaching my office saying, "Well, my students, uh, rather my child, uh, does not feel welcome in school. Uh, my my child has been streamed into a certain." Uh, area of education. So there's so many things that we've been working on uh, in terms of uh, the Black Caucus and and uh, so we will continue in that effort and, and I'm, I'm glad that I have this uh, this position to do that as uh, the first Black member of provincial parliament in Brampton and, and in Peel region and uh, I guess in a way I feel it is my duty to do that uh, because I know there's younger people who are, who are watching right now uh, look up to us uh, in order to to right the wrongs, I guess you could say, as, as we talk about Black History Month right now. And uh, so there's a lot of work to be done and I look forward to it. And uh, like I said, I'm passionate about it and I'm, I'm enjoying uh, doing this work. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And thank you everyone for your service. And uh, it's uh, really important that you are using this platform to encourage all of us who are on uh, this um, call uh, to think deeply and to in order you know about our services to to the black community i'm going to move on to uh, another question and again i'll go around starting with craig if uh, that's okay with you uh, can you tell us about uh, the initiatives that you would like to highlight that came into being uh, for you and about the goals and mandates of some of those uh, initiatives. Uh, Greg, you're muted. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't learn. You'd, you'd think I was on a radio show. I'd, I'd have figured that out. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm looking at in terms of where I am now, as I said, uh, in terms of where we are placed in Black Opportunity Fund, which has a very specific focus on building a large pool of capital um, to, to, to sustainably fund Black community initiatives. I said that really is in sync with the trajectory of what I've done. And I've done a lot of work with various organizations, programs, and so on, starting back with, with um, you know, my work I, I, and the, the social justice active, activism work I've done since at York. And I mean, it, some of the things that I'm very pleased that in terms of initiatives, is I kind of, I, I mentioned to you that that piece about the uh, my my colleagues and classmates and 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 being entrapped in the criminal justice system and I look at where they are now and where they are placed and they're all incredibly successful and I look at where their trajectory would have been if if we didn't have that intervention and again it was because of York and 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 the support we had but one of the other things is I mean in my first year at York. Um, I was uh, I was racially profiled and, and harassed at Square One Shopping Mall, and I sued Square One Shopping Mall uh, for racial harassment as well as their um, uh, their security company, company Hammerson Security. And I'd only been in Canada four years. I just moved from Jamaica and jumped ahead into into grade nine, and four years later. You know, I, I, I was too naive and too stupid to realize that you can't, you know, a, 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 a black immigrant with no money can't sue a multi-billion dollar corporation and win. So because I didn't know any better, I just did it. And then based on that, we also pushed um, and carried that to the Human Rights Commission. And they did an investigation, did a report and found out that there were uh, systemic issues around that. And the, the Trespass to Property Act got changed. Uh, as a result of that of that study, um, as it related to to malls, so I mean, very proud of in terms of those initiatives, and that kind of led me into the work that I was doing. And one of the things 
the key things from that is that you realize because you're always you always hear people one person can't make a difference and that, that's absolutely not true um one person can make a massive difference and kamika is making a massive difference in terms of what she's doing kevin is talking about what what he has done so i mean if that's one thing to tell the students is 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 there there is no barrier in terms of what you can you can do you know and and use the linkages around you use the community your community is incredibly strong incredibly powerful and it has a history of social justice activism as well as creates linkages and so on that can help you in your career trajectory um so it's important don't just don't just look at getting the piece of paper if you spend four years there or how many years you spent and all you did was get a piece of paper then you wasted the time okay make sure you build out those opportunities and you may change a couple of times of where you end up um but all of those pieces are are foundational pieces in in your journey Thank you so much, uh, Greg. Um, Kamika, I would ask some question. Uh, can you tell us about uh, some of the initiatives that you would like to highlight that have come into fruition for you and the goals and initiatives, mandates of those initiatives? Okay, sure. Um, I'd like to highlight the Black Female Lawyers Network. Um, I'm, as I think I said earlier, their treasurer as, one of, as well as one of their board of directors. Um, the network started in 2006 as an intimate gathering of colleagues and friends wanting to foster dialogue, create professional development opportunities and enable mentorship opportunities. That inaugural session blossomed into the annual Sisters in Law Retreat and fundraiser which includes a full day event attracting legal professionals and other attendees across Canada. The retreat is a safe space for students and practitioners to convene, share, and learn. Through partnerships with the Ontario Justice Education Network, the retreat has expanded to include a program that supports participation of high school girls who are matched with mentors to develop skills that positively impact their life experiences. It's powerful to see the network grow and the ripple effect it has had across the communities. We serve high school students, law students, internationally trained lawyers, and offer networking opportunities, professional development, mentorship, legal resources, and wellness initiatives. We've hosted seminars on financial literacy, women's health, and truly, <coughs> and sorry, women's health and truly anything as diverse in supporting women's needs. We've had our membership be exceptionally vulnerable with us, sharing what it's like to work in the profession and being their authentic selves. We've had black lawyers tell us they feel both hyper-visible, often being the only black woman in the room, while at the same time feeling invisible because they may not have had the connections in that room that others have access to. This is the reality of what we're hearing from some of our members when they share their stories. The Black Female Lawyers Network gives women a space to share their experiences and to feel supported. Thank you. Thank you, Kamika. And uh, Kevin, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives that you've been involved in and uh, some of the highlights of those initiatives? All right, thank you, Daniel. I wanna thank as well, Kamika, that, that was amazing. Uh, story and uh, I really appreciate all, all you're doing uh, for black female lawyers in in the province and probably in the country as well. Uh, my, one of the first things I did in 2018 uh, as the critic for community safety and corrections, uh, I brought first brought forth the very first bill uh, in 2018 to end carding. Uh, I know Craig just mentioned uh, he was uh, racially profiled. I as well have been racially profiled. Uh, by the police. And I don't really know too many uh, Black men who haven't been racially profiled uh, over the years. So I brought forward that bill. Uh, I spoke to our leader. I said, you know, this is something uh, which needs to come forward. And uh, she agreed. So I brought it forward. Unfortunately, it was uh, turned down uh, by the government, but it's something I'm going to continue to push forward because we still see uh, young Black men, uh, primarily men, uh, being pulled over uh, for just being black, driving being black, walking down the street being black. Uh, so unfortunately it didn't pass, but I'm not gonna give up. There, there's still many opportunities to bring forward this bill again. 
Uh, I also mentioned um, uh, some of the work we've been doing around uh, the school boards. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've had uh, parents approaching us, asking us to, to uh, make some changes, uh, not just in the Peel District School Board, but other school boards across Ontario, where we've seen uh, uh, young Black men and women who've been streamed into different areas of, of education, uh, who don't, don't feel safe, who don't feel uh, at home in, in, in the educational system. So we've been working on that as well as, as a member of the Black Caucus, uh, making sure that uh, Black students uh, are treated fairly and uh, that they get the uh, proper education that they need. So those two areas I've, I've been uh, fairly passionate about, I've been working on over the last few years. But as I mentioned before, as part of the Black Caucus, we look at every area uh, in housing as well. Uh, and uh, in, in also with regards to jobs and businesses, a lot of businesses in Little Jamaica, we all know where that is around, around the Eglinton area, uh, have been affected by the the uh, development of the of the um, of the subway system there, and many businesses have gone under, and they have not uh, been given supports uh, in terms of uh, financial support. So that's something myself and Jill Andrew, who's who's a member of the Black Caucus who lives in uh, Toronto St. Paul, we've been pushing this government to to make sure they provide the supports for these businesses. Unfortunately, we've already lost too many of them already, uh, but uh, these are things which we have to. Uh, look at and make sure that we continue to uh, advocate on behalf of our community. Thank you once again. I am just so delighted to hear all the good work that you're doing uh, to support Black communities. I'm going to ask the last question, and uh, there may be more questions in the Q&A uh, after. Uh, but this is the last kind of a question for, for us to go around the panel. And I'll begin with uh, Kevin. Um, how do you envision uh, the future uh, of Black communities? And so that's the first part. And then the second part is what advice would you give uh, to students, um, Black students? Uh, and anybody perhaps uh, on the panel, on the call uh, today? Well, I, I see the future for the Black community as, as a positive one. However, I know there's so much work to be done. I mean, I, I mentioned the little Jamaican and, and, the, and the issues we have there. Uh, many communities across uh, Ontario still aren't given the proper supports uh, in terms of financial supports for businesses, in terms of uh, community initiatives for, for our younger generation, giving them a safe place to, to grow up in. So we really have to look at um, our community. And we have to actually work together. Uh, myself, Kamika, Craig, all leaders in the community have to work together because I've seen too many fractions uh, within our community. And I, I know uh, they're sort of shaking their head that they know what I'm talking about. We have to work together in order to make sure that our community uh, prospers. And I haven't seen that, unfortunately. Uh, I know as a member of the Black Caucus, we are cohesive uh, and we, we attempt to uh, take on these challenges. But I think if we get all these groups together and uh, to work on ways to better our community, that would be, uh, that would be a positive. In terms of uh, uh, advice for students, uh, don't give up on your dreams, continue doing what you're doing. Uh, you may, as Craig mentioned, uh, find yourself going into different streams throughout uh, uh, your, your, your life and your, your educational um, uh, careers. And uh, it's, it's different than it was when I was in school. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I was also in journalism for 17 years. I was a uh, weather broadcaster, but that has all changed. Uh, it's not like it used to be. It is all digital now. So uh, you're not finding a lot of people uh, getting those positions on air. Uh, it's, everything's changed to digital. So you have to be aware that as as we go through the years, things are going to change in terms of uh, what careers, what career choices are out there. So, so I, I would actually advise a lot of students to uh, uh, check with career counselors or guidance counselors uh, if if you're struggling as to what you want to do and uh, trying to, trying to find your footing. Uh, find your I guess uh, uh, I guess I'm trying trying to think of, trying to think of the, of the best word for this. Uh, find your stream, find, find the area you want to get into, and just focus on that one and, and move forward. I know York University has been beneficial for me, and uh, with the uh, 
uh, choices I, 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 I made in terms of uh, uh, taking political science. And it, it helped me when I got into politics, understand the workings of politics. I didn't understand everything. I, uh, like at Queen's Park, I didn't understand the workings of Queen's Park, but uh, it definitely helped me understand the different levels of government and how they interact with each other. So, so it's, 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 you really have to sit down with yourself and your family and decide what you really want to do and stick with those goals. But like I said, you may find yourself drifting into other areas and different paths, that's, that's okay. I didn't always know what I wanted to do when I was uh, your age, uh, but uh, you, you, you should have an idea of what, sh what your strengths and weaknesses are. My, my strengths was, was always communication. So I knew I was going to get into something uh, in the field of communications, whether it was journalism, whether it's politics. And uh, once you figure that out, it's, it's a little bit easier. And get into a career that's not just going to be a job. Get into a career that's going to be a passion or a love of yours. Otherwise, you're really not going to you're not going to enjoy uh, the nine to five uh, rigor of a, of, a, of a particular career. So do what you love, and uh, I guess that's the best way of, of putting it. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to cycle back to Craig and kind of uh, ask that last question. How do you envision the future of Black communities? And what advice would you give to the students? As Yeah, the positioning um, that Kevin has had is, 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 is exactly right. There's, there's a lot of systemic issues. The history is there. We, we don't get taught it, but it is there. And it is important that we do address that. I saw a note in the, in the Q&A with, with regard to that and the curriculum, because we need to, we need to understand our, our place. We're, we're at a place in time now where, um, as they say, black is the new black. We are we are we are being seen now. Black is in season um, because of the George Floyd uh, incident. Um, but seasons change. Um, so what we need to understand is we're getting heard, and we need to come together. Um, so that's the key point that Kevin said. There's a number of organizations, a number of people working on different things, but we have a united goal. We need to unite. We need to look at how do we support each other. Um, and with Black Opportunity Fund, all the work that we do is about collaborating with other organizations and amplifying them, right? It's about um, looking at how we can work together as a, as a unit um, and look at upstream approaches, right? Because a lot of the work we're, we're spent is doing, you know, people are in the, in the river drowning and we're having to drag them out. And yes, we need to do that. But we also need to go upstream and find out why are our why is our why are members of our community falling into the water in the first place? What do we need to do? Is there education we need to do? Do we need to put up fences? What is it? So we need to take strategic approaches. We need it to, to do it together. Um, and we have an opportunity, as I said, that uh, we are being heard now. So it is an opportunity. There, there's a significant amount of opportunities, and, and we need to take an abundance approach rather than a, a scarcity approach. To addressing them. Um, in terms of advice to students, absolutely what Kevin has said. One of the things that we have seen during the pandemic is the people who were set up to be, you know, agile, who have multiple skill sets, uh, are the ones who are prospering. They're being given opportunities to innovate. So it is important that you have that mindset that yes, you should have a focus. And as Kevin said, the focus should not necessarily be on a job title. It is about what is my skill set? What is my strength? And if Kevin's strength is communications, then, then you need to map out what are the careers where that is going to be an asset. If, if, if your, your focus is on, you know, you're very organized it's, or you have an analytic mind or so, then find careers that map onto that skill set. And the additional piece I want to want to want to suggest is yes, find a career that utilizes those skill sets, um, but also look at you may not find all of the things in terms of your passion in your career, but that's when you find things outside of it. What community involvement that you can you do that will allow you to have that kind of involvement, which is as we're hearing. You know, that's the involvement that you're doing in other community organizations. Kamika talked about the work that, that she's doing. So, so find that path in terms of a career 
um, that is going to speak to your strengths, then you you look at it's ideal if you can find a career that speaks to your strength and and your passion. But if it's not, and you have to build up to it, then make sure you find places to um, fulfill that passion. And it can be through not-for-profit community work, volunteerism, um, what, ha what have you. But it's important to figure out who you are, you know, who you are, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, um, and, and map out your journey based on that. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm glad you've sort of touched on the challenges, the difficulties, the limitations, but also how to move forward by identifying your strengths, limitations, you know, passion and things you love to do. I'm going to ask Kamika last, but not least, how do you envision the future of uh, Black communities and what advice would you give to, to students? And then we'll move into some of the questions in the Q&A. Okay, um, well, I think Kevin and Craig expressed themselves on or themselves rather on this topic very eloquently. Um, so I don't want to be repetitive. Um, what I would like to say is when I think of what I envision the future uh, for black communities, I think of one where the opportunities are abundant for us and where we're seen and valued for our full selves. Um, Craig mentioned uh, George Floyd and um, uh, in the summertime of the pandemic. And during that time, um, my employer decided to build together this massive network called the Black North Initiative. And um, the purpose of it was to increase, or the initial purpose of it, Black North is now a beast of its own and has taken on lots of areas of systematic racism within Canada. Um, but the initial impetus of it was to get companies to sign a pledge that they would increase within the next three to five years, the number of Blacks in high level and C-suite positions in Toronto. And that's really significant because there are, I, I wouldn't have fingers and toes to tell you how many times I've been in a room where I'm either the only female or the only visible minority or both. And um, I would like to envision a future where there are many Kamikas, uh, there are many Kevins and there are many Craigs. Um, I'm, I don't need to be the pioneer. I don't want to be the lone woman standing, championing the cause. I'm happy there's space for so many of us and there's space for all of us, in fact. And I would love to see that increase over the next coming years um, where I'm stepping into meetings and the CEOs are Blacks, the CFOs are Blacks, uh, the senior partners are Blacks. That would be, that would be incredible for me. And that's what, the, that's what I'm working towards creating and pulling up the little sisters behind me to say, come on, you can do it. Um, what advice would I give to students? Well, I don't know if I'm in a position to give anybody advice on anything, um, but I would say networking is incredibly important and you should get out there. Um, don't be afraid, uh, don't be shy, ask somebody for help, join the clubs, join the, um, the, the, the programs that have diverse interest in, in or diversity in the interest that you have and enjoy it. It need not be a linear path. I think a lot of people, particularly in law, thinks there's only one path to being a lawyer. There's only one way to act, one way to look, one way to dress. No, it, it's the way you want it to be. And um, so I would encourage people to, to get out there and network because I think that it builds a level of self-confidence within yourself and the ability to be able to stand up in front of a crowd and be visible and feel present and feel accepted. The other thing I would say is we, sh especially as Black people, need to be very mindful of how we speak to ourselves. I think quite often we talk about what we can't do or what the roadblock is in front of us. And I think if we start speaking more positively into our mindsets and tell ourselves that we are worthy and we belong in this space, in any space, it will make such a difference in terms, not just in your mindset, but in your attitude and your approach to life. I think self-care is extremely important. That mental health in the Black community is extremely important. Um, 
So that would be my advice to nurture those aspects of yourself. It's not just the academics, it's the fulsome picture to create this beautiful, healed, wonderful person exploring life and enjoying it. Thank you, Kamika. I like the theme that, yes, I can, and putting that into your mind. Um, and I guess that was the theme from uh, uh, all three of you. So we're going to try and get to some of the questions in the Q&A, uh, as many as we can. I don't promise we'll be able to. Some of them are very specific to uh, some of um, some of our panelists. But I'll start with this, this question. Uh, that one of the uh, participants um, is asking, what do black communities want or need from their counter communities, such as the Italian community, South Asian communities and others? Anyone? Um, uh, sure, Craig. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting one. And it comes to a point which I'll jump off from what Kamika said about the self-care to our community. We talk about, we, we confuse race with ethnicity, with nationality all the time. So the question asks about the black community and talks about other communities, because we're always getting this thing where we challenge the black, you know, other communities are doing this, other communities get along, black community doesn't get along. And I said, well, which community gets along? And they name, like you just heard, well, the Italian community, that, that's a country. Black's not a country. Or you hear, I'm from Brampton, like Kevin, the South Asian community. I'm like, really? And there, there are literally two world wars that tell us that the white community doesn't get along, right? There are North Korea and South Korea have a the same, you know, a line between them and point nuclear weapons at each other. We have caste systems in South Asia, but we have we put this expectation on the black community to be a monolithic group. And we're not, and we're. It's okay to, to understand and respect our diversity, diversity of opinion. There is no black community. There are black communities, and understand because of the nature of systemic racism that we do have to unite and have that kind of Pan African view. But we need to stop setting these standards for ourselves that nobody else is. And because of that, we 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 listen to these negative tropes like like for example one i always hear is there you know in the us there's more black people black men in jail than there are in university it's complete garbage there's three times as many black men in four-year degree grants in universities that, that are in prison but it sounds like it could be true it's it so much sounds like it could be true that barack obama has said it that the president of the naacp has said it because it sounds like it could be true and we don't fact check because again we we think it's okay so we have to start from that self-care thing and challenge these notions or the, you know, what about violence and, you know, black on black violence and 96% of black people killed or killed by other black people. I'm like, yeah, that sounds horrible until you find out that, you know, 90% of white people are killed by other white people. Crime and murder is, is, is focused on, on geography, right? People, you know, that, and, and we live in, in societies that are racially segregated. So the first thing is, Let's understand what is that identity, what does it mean, and, and um, practice self-care, um, challenge ourselves, but also be realistic and understand, um, you know, what our, what our goals are, what we need to be focused on is, is, is something that I would suggest. Thank you so much, uh, Craig. Uh, anything to add on to that or from any of the panelists or should we move on? I think Craig has said it well. Has said it well, okay, well, thank you. I, I was, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this question is to Kevin. I would love to see black history integrated into history classes across the school boards. What can we do as parents to help put this into action? Well, I agree. And uh, not only uh, Black history, but also uh, talk about Indigenous uh, history. So we really have to come together to look at uh, what, what is missing in our educational system. When I was growing up, I, I had no courses on, on Black history. I had to learn from, from TV or from what my parents were telling me. So I, at the time, 
for us to have those courses um, and have these, these uh, discussions about it. Uh, parents definitely are, are key to getting these uh, uh, changes in our educational system. Uh, meeting, with, uh, meet, meeting, meeting with uh, uh, educators, meeting with uh, uh, school boards, and I think it's going to happen. It, it's, it seems to be slowly uh, coming into, into fruition, but I, I think it will be happening uh, most likely in our lifetime, uh, hopefully sooner, sooner than that. But it is something which is, which is needed, uh, not just for Black students, but for all students, for, for Caucasian students, for, for Asian students to understand the Black community and, and get rid of these stereotypes uh, about, uh, about our community and about our, our, our upbringing. So, I, I will continue to push for that, uh, and uh, I have been pushing for that uh, at Queen's Park, so uh, this is something which is long overdue, and something we definitely need. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kamika, you want to, uh, I guess that was a question uh, directly uh, to Kevin, um, but you have a question here, Kamika, that a Shawak student is asking. You've touched on it, but I, I think uh, they just need to have some clarification. I'm in social work and some say that the field ha has predominantly white female work workers uh, or women, sorry, female workers. As a black woman who is studying social work, how do I ad address conversations of hyper visibility? Perhaps um, it's happening in more areas as well, I'm not sure. Well, uh, I, I would think that that happens in many areas in the professional sphere. Professional sphere. Um, I, it's a tough one because you, you have to balance the line between being able to not be afraid to openly share your experiences and talk about your blackness and the journey and the challenges that, uh, or systematic challenges that have impacted your career path or how you've been able to access the program. You know, I can use me as an example or any uh, female lawyer as an example. Universities here are largely male in terms of law school and largely white. And when you look at the law firms and you look at the partners at the higher levels, majority of them are male. And then you break that out even further, they're largely white. Um, and so how do you address it? Well, there's no single hammer that's going to knock down the wall, but you address it by every day, getting up and going into work and you talk about your experience, you talk about your blackness, you talk about the challenges that you have faced or the difficulties in accessing uh, loans from financial institutions for your education, or uh, support, you know, people talk about, oh, share this experience, have your family support you. A lot of, um, a lot of people within our community don't have that kind of familial support, don't have those kinds of networks. And so it's really important, I think, for us to, you, you can't look for it in one place, or I don't think you should look for it in a singular place. So looking for it exclusively in the social work faculty when it doesn't quite exist, it can feel um, like there is a weight on you as as the person, the, the only person to carry the blackness into the profession or the only person that like, you've got this monkey on your back basically to prove that I'm different from what your stereotype of black people are. I'm different from what your stereotype of people from the Caribbean are supposed to be. Uh, I, I would find support in larger community networks to be able to take some of that weight off yourself and continue to push and continue to encourage other young women and other young men to enter the field of social work and, and increase the level of diversity in the profession. Thank you, Kamika. And uh, Greg, uh, there's this question here for you and I think it might be one of the last questions that uh, we have um, for, for the call. Um, during your time with the Toronto Police uh, Community uh, Consultation, I think, committee, did you see any progress in the relationship between Toronto Police and the Black community? So that's one question. And then there is a second part. Maybe we'll start with that. Peace. Yeah, I mean, I the time I was with the uh, Toronto Chief of Police Black Community Consultation, 
committee is at the time that they were um, looking at the police engagement, getting you know, the, the getting rid of carding and and so on, and and had to talk about how do we interact with police. There were also discussions about you know BLM and how do, how does the police and the chief interact with with them. So we've seen a lot of progress. Um, but I mean, I've been working with with police again since I was probably nineteen. Um, so I've you know seen there. I sat in the courtroom with Lester um, in the trial of of the police who killed Lester Donaldson. Uh, um, you know, three the police broke into his home, disabled black man sitting in his bed eating supper, and um, shot him to death, and and got away with with, with claiming self defense. Um, and that's because of that case. We have the SIU. So I was there with Charlie Roach and Lennox, Lennox Farrell and Dudley Laws as a as a kid, 19 year old. So I were, you know, so I've seen the, the progression. So we've made progress, but the challenge is is, is that we we don't recognize that uh, the additional layer. It's it's like when we see the 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 George Floyd situation. So Canada is reacting to that and they cannot really understand what does that has to do with the Canadian context because they're not aware of the Orlando Bowen situation. They're not aware of, you know, many situations that we've had right here in Canada with police interaction, with First Nation people, with a recent study, uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission study just over a year ago that found that Black people in Toronto are 20 times more likely to be killed by than white people by, by Toronto police. You know, so it is important that we educate ourselves. Yes, we have a long way to go, but we need to keep pushing. You know, I personally have had my car tires slashed by Toronto police in a routine traffic stop in, in Hyde Park without u- u- using a knife, right, in an interaction. I've had police try to arrest me in my driveway, accusing me of breaking into my own home when I was younger. So these are these are real, and we have to understand that that this is Canada. It is part of the reality here. Uh, we, it may not get as much exposure, but but it, it's here. Are things changing? Absolutely, um, because things are being forced to change, and we have the opportunity to keep keep forcing it and and um, and using our voice. Right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And um, there is one here um anybody can jump in i know many industries now want people of color this is their kind of uh term that the person has used uh to uh sort of the employee to fit the diversity quarter um have you experienced that if so how do you deal with with those sort of experiences where companies are wanting just to feed uh, this diversity quarter. Well, if I, if I could uh, jump in and then uh, let Kamika go in as well. Uh, it's, it's the timing, it's, it's times are changing. As Craig said, we are getting to the point where things are improving. Um, many companies, and I'm not sure if pressure is the word, but uh, are, are aware that uh, they need to develop a diversity committee within their own business in order to to bring in uh, diverse candidates. And, it, and it's actually, they're also realizing this is actually beneficial. It's it's not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing, uh, economically in terms of uh, helping their, their company grow uh, to have more than just Caucasian workers in, in, in their field. So it's something which uh, obviously is long overdue. Uh, I, it's unfortunate. It, it, it has to come to that. I would have liked to, to see businesses uh, do it on their own, uh, but uh, I guess uh, the George Floyd uh, issue has, has brought a lot to light and um, many companies see now that uh, uh, this is something which is a positive and not a negative. Yeah, I agree. I, mean, I think BIPOC recruiters have never been busier or more relevant. LinkedIn has never been a more <laughs> inclusive space for DNI. <laughs> Um, initiatives than it's been before. Um, I'm of two minds about this subject matter, um, largely because I think you can't have it both ways and you can't have everything. And I don't care why they're including us. I care that we are being included. I I want us to get in there. And once we're inside the machine, then we can change the machine from the inside out. Um, So I'm 
thrilled that more companies are trying to actively recruit um, Blacks and BIPOC individuals for high level positions that they're, they've made a commitment to increase their diversity and inclusion, not just in terms of race, but gender, um, uh, sexuality, unique, um, able-bodiedness or lack thereof. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I think once, once the times are changing and once we get, and we already are getting enough of us inside those spaces, the conversations now become very different. I think Kevin expressed it really well that when you have a board that, that is diverse or you have a management team that is diverse and it's, it's not just a, a, about race, it's diversity in perspectives, we are four black people sitting here with four different experiences. So when you put us together to sit down and have a conversation and make a decision about high level, top level, bottom line um, decisions that the company needs to make the direction, you come out with a more creative and thorough kind of um, approach to your businesses. So I think it's a wonderful thing personally. Can I Excellent. Can I jump in, if you don't yeah, mind? Sure. Daniel, too? I, and, and excellent comments, uh, Kevin and, and um, uh, Kamiko. What, and I, I, I've done a lot of, one of the things that I also do is systemic um, racism training, de and I, and I do it here and in, in the U.S. So one of the things that had happened because of, because of this reaction, um, and one of the things I, I, I saw from many corporations, even some in, in government ministries, is a lot of white firms were getting job, were getting contracts to recruit black executives as a result of this. Or, or you know, the first thing that happened is the first Black History Month. A lot of companies announced during Black History Month, during February, the hiring of a head of diversity, equity, and inclusion, reporting into HR, which had no power, no resources behind it. So I'm more excited to see what you do in September or October than what you announced in February. And are you hiring a general counsel? Are you hiring a, you know, if it's a municipality, are you hiring a head of public works or, 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 or a CFO as opposed to a head of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Because we can do other things other than diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so the good things are happening, but you have to also change culture because that's where the difference between diversity and inclusion is. Um, because, for example, the National Football League, the NFL, has 80% Black but there's one black coach and no black president. So that's diverse, it's not inclusive. It's where's the power, right? So, and if you bring one person in, a black person in, but you're not providing an, a culture of inclusiveness that they're not in a safe space um, and that's black women, but you know, black women are always have to tone police themselves so as not to be accused of being the, the angry black women and that that's that's the reality of 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 the, the you know so we're not allowed to bring our whole selves to work so more and more that's changing because of the George Floyd and black employees are being asked to speak up and lead these teams but when things change we have to be careful that we're not putting the black employees out on a limb and we're going to cut down the limb when when things when things change so we have to ensure that the culture has changed as well and, and, and not just focus on numbers, which is diversity, but we actually focus on inclusion, which is about power and control as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so, so much, everyone. Uh, we are coming to the conclusion of uh, our uh, panel presentation. So thank you for those of you joining this call. Thank you to Craig Kamika, Kevin for sharing your journeys and providing invaluable advice and inspiration. I'm inspired myself <laughs> uh, as a, you know, as a person chairing this uh, panel. So please visit the uh, liberal arts and professional studies website for inf information about the upcoming webinars and to register for the next webinar. Moving Forward, Thriving with English Degree taking place on February the 17th from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. You can find the registration link now in the chat. More information about the upcoming uh, Moving Forward webinars can be found in the Liberal Arts and Professional Studies website and the Moving Forward webinars page. 
Again, thank you, thank you so much. And it's just been great. And I'm sure uh, the students that have attended and others have been inspired. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honored to be on the panel, right. Kevin and, and, and Kamika. Thank you so much. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Kamika.